My name is Benjamin Dalton and I am a PhD student in French. I'm writing a thesis about plasticity in French, contemporary French philosophy. So I am lead researcher on the project Narrating Plasticity, Stories of Transformation Between the Plastic Arts and Neurosciences. I'm looking at plasticity uh, in neuroscience, plasticity in art and the plastic arts, and plasticity in philosophy. Plasticity in the arts is basically any art uh, created when something is moulded into shape. Plasticity in the neurosciences refers to the plasticity of the brain, so the brain's capacity to transform and be malleable and adapt. I'm interested in how contemporary French philosophy engages and dialogues with uh, contemporary neuroscience. The French philosopher Catherine Malibu has elaborated her own concept of plasticity, how the brain develops over the course of a lifetime, and what questions that poses to philosophy. I always knew from the start that I wanted to research the dialogue between contemporary French philosophy and neuroscience. But actually something happened to me at the beginning of my PhD that made me view everything in a much more personal light. I was on a date with a guy one evening. These guys came past and they were yelling homophobic abuse at us. And uh, we were actually involved in a, an attack, which resulted in me being taken to hospital. I remember the doctor coming to me and saying, your uh, CT scan shows that nothing has been incurred from the attack. You have a pre-existing brain tumour. Eventually they decided that I needed uh, brain surgery. Suddenly having to think about my brain from a much more personal perspective led me to this project, in fact, to think about what it means to communicate uh, changes in your brain. I wanted this project to, um, to put together art, science and philosophy in order to kind of transform all of these domains in relation to each other. And I also wanted myself as a researcher to challenge the ways I thought about philosophical plasticity. My name's Amanda Deutsch. I work with ceramics. I quite often use subjects that are to do with science. I made a work um, called Kill or Cure. I was demonstrating in the artwork the effect of lithium on rock. It heated up so it lowers the melting point, but also thinking about its effect on the human body. And I used bone china clay, which again, all the elements in the bone china clay are in the human body as well and have a biological function. I'd already been thinking about the brain in terms of the lithium carbonate and its effects on the brain. I also like the idea of, of uh, processes and things developing over time and how that could be thought about and how that could develop the project I had already started and it could I could see how it could evolve from what I'd already been doing in my practice. I became interested in Dr Sandrine Touré's team of neuroscientists at Maurice Vole Institute because they're all researching many different forms of plasticity. My name is Sandrine Touré. I'm a senior lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience. When you approached me, I was, um, it really made me think a little bit that indeed there is a lot more in common than I would have thought before. Um, first, indeed, what we study is brain plasticity at you know its pure definition. How can you modulate and change your brain? There is a lot in common in between what you can do with a blank canvas and what you can do uh, with the brain. How can you influence you know uh, connection in the brain and what can you produce on a canvas or looking at uh, making sculpture? So there is a lot in common, and this was a really I thought a really interesting thought and not something that was that has occurred to me immediately, although it should have, because it is the same word. So when you think a little bit more deeply what the relation between uh, neuroscience and art is that, yeah, you can start with something very blank and trying to influence what is going to happen uh, and what will be the end product. And we all look at plasticity in the context of neurogenesis. Look at old age and memory. Um, I look at the impact of diet. I'm looking at the impact of chronic stress. I look at hormones and postnatal depression. And I look at the effects of childhood abuse. It was really interesting seeing plasticity through the eyes of an artist instead of a scientist. We have very specific ways of looking at plasticity, looking at the effects of it and measuring it. I really liked the idea of bringing various forms of and ways of thinking kind of together and it's kind of remarkable how even though we look at it from a very scientific way. Plasticity actually kind of 
resonates on all levels in a very similar way. Science is actually quite creative, much like art. We aren't constrained by boundaries, necessarily. When we went over to Amanda's workshop, it was quite interesting. She basically gave us all this clay and was just like, do something, be creative, and I'm not very creative, so I didn't know what to do. So I just made a brain. And then actually, even just doing that, she had all these ideas of like, oh, well, why don't you do it like this? And then I was like, oh, no, you can't, because that's not what a brain looks like. Like, that's a disease. And then it actually made into, into this really interesting thing where she, like, showed the progression of a disease. When we brought Amanda to the lab and showed her cells and where we work and what we do with them. I remember you asked me, when you look at these cells, how does it make you think about the world and life? And as scientists, you get so detached from your work and it's so technical, you don't really think about things like that. People in science um, only interact with people in science, whereas art influences culture, influences people, influences how people behave and think. So I think to go from a microscopic level um, in the lab to something much bigger like art, which anybody can look at and interpret, is mm -hmm. a really good thing for making people understand and changing mentality. You have this great kind of um, destructive quality to your work as well. I'd also been interested in and done work with philosophy as well as science yeah. as well. So mm. they were both things that I was interested in because I'm interested in how to think and ways of thinking and how to um, how how we make meaning and how we interpret and understand things, which science and philosophy are both methods of trying to understand knowledge. You were talking about Heraclitus yeah. and and these other much older philosophers. Mm -hmm. And it made me think, oh, actually, philosophy has weirdly been talking about plasticity a lot longer than we think. It's been talking about change and transformation and metamorphosis. I didn't know how it would go. I had no idea, because mm -hmm. I didn't know what you'd be like, what the scientists would be like, or how I'd be received. It was really good having lots of opportunities to have discussions with other people about ideas because most of the time I'm just on my own thinking things myself and testing them and then not being sure and you know um, having to feel my way um, so it, it's really helpful and stimulating to have um, the opportunity to discuss things with somebody else. Well I really loved going to the lab mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed um, delving into the, all the different information and reading all the philosophy. I found it has helped me to figure out a way of proceeding with my work that's a bit more open. I'm Isabel Blomfield and I'm a PhD student, so I'm studying neurostem cells. I'm William Martin and uh, I've been working primarily in ceramics. My name is uh, Anna Koliakou and I'm Knowledge uh, Exchange Associate for Science at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience uh, on behalf of the Cultural Institute at King's College London. I'm Jennifer Dingra and I'm a future doctor and I work in the sexual health sector. About science and when I'm even thinking about my own science I create analogies, I'm likening this system to something a bit more relatable that I see in the real world and art is very much like that. You can see structures or patterns or the way you view something, it's the same with biology, it's not so abstract, you can see it in the world around you. Um, so I definitely think it helps to become more relatable to people, to understand what you're seeing in a Petri dish is actually not something weird and alien, it's something that you see all around you anyway. Well, when we first started talking, my first thoughts were the way that um, plastic arts like ceramic are actively used for people who are recovering from brain damage. I, I particularly like the aspect of the project that uh, seeks to encourage um, a different way uh, of thinking. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to patients suffering from brain damage. Um, somebody uh, spoke once uh, about uh, the art of formulation, so how you, you understand and express yourself, but also how other people perceive you in the clinical context. And I would like to see more work in where those two disciplines uh, come together, so the practice of, uh, of plasticity, the expression of plasticity, and how it can be implemented uh, in the clinical care. It's clear now that sexual and gender identities and desires are more plastic than ever before. And we kind of think of gender these days as something that's constantly changing and taking on new forms. And so to support this changing community, the healthcare and education systems need to communicate and respond to the plasticity of sexual and gender identity. What do you think hasn't been quite finished in this project and where could the future of this go? I could definitely do more with the neuroscience. I think there's lots more to explore there. 
all these questions of communication and how to narrate plasticity and how to communicate plasticity. And I'd want to figure, find a way of trying that out within real clinical settings mm. and see what, how clinicians would respond to these conceptual ideas about how people who have gone through plastic changes, mm. be it in the brain or anywhere else, can communicate those. What is the kind of like more obvious proof that um, thought is material form mm. than the plastic brain. Because your brain is forming pathways. It's, it's creating structures mm. in response to your thinking and your environment and how you're responding to it. And you can build on those structures once they're there.